Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School. I think today, as you can see, with many activities going on, we're going to have a little bit of a challenge, and that's okay as they go back and forth getting the preparations for the meal, because when everybody comes, boom, they'll need to start. Kind of reminds me when I was in Indonesia in 1982 for a summer mission trip. Um, we actually, during the service, a chicken would walk up and down between the aisles. So in the, I don't know who was preaching at that point in time, whether it was one of the students or one of the missionaries, but uh, the chicken kept going up and back and forth. And I thought, oh, this is really precarious. And I actually remember a church in Bible college, when I went to Crown College, we went up to a church Oh, somewhere between here and there, and the guy preached, the pastor preached on the book of Leviticus for a full year. And they had a bus ministry, so they had all these young kids coming and to keep their attention. And I remember one of the young guys, he was kind of the rabble rouser, sitting in the front row tossing coins into the offering plate as the pastor was preaching until the preacher's wife went and grabbed him by the nab of the neck. Have you ever heard of the book? It was actually Dory, the girl that no one, nobody loved. Have you ever heard of her? Okay, a few of you. It's old time, but it was Dory, I think Van Stone and her husband Lloyd. Um, since been w with the Lord for quite a while, but uh, definitely some distractions. It's a good thing, a lot of great things going on at this church and we're really, really pleased that. Uh, I'm glad you're here today. I wanna thank you for coming. Uh, mention that there is coffee in the hallway if you want to get that there because they, they move the pots into the kitchen area. Um, they remind us if we would when we leave, we kind of pick up and make the environment look a little bit like it was, you know, as far as the... Uh, Phoebe, do you have another paper we can give over here? Um, kind of clean up the tables a little bit, put the crayons back in spot there for uh, the event that's going to take place. I will try to end the class a little bit early because uh, people are going to be starting to come in and wanting to get their potluck stuff in order. Uh, let's see, what else was I going to tell you? Um, I, th I think that's, that's it. Oh, I wanted to uh, say thank you for bringing, Carol, thank you for bringing the goodies today. Uh, they're over there for us next week. And there is the sign-up sheet. We have an open spot if anybody wants to bring something the next week. And then the final week will be on May 7th, and I will bring us some, some treats that day. One of the things that I had really was intrigued about when I did the study on Psalms, and I taught that class probably a year ago here, was he started looking at the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament, his power thereof. And I, I kind of took the telescope and looked out into the sky. And when I was studying for that, I was just amazed at how awesome God is. I mean, you just start realizing how huge the universe is and the world is. And that you know, we got our little dancing bear act here on this planet Earth thinking we're something else. And yet there's a God who created. Much of the world worships the creation. And, and we, so, we say, no, there's a creator who made this. And it's pretty exciting. And I'm going to finish the last three things that I've... I had read that book, I Do Not Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, um, by Norman Geisler and a gentleman by the name of Frank Turek, I believe it is. And he talked about... Um, Anthropic constants, okay? Those of you who've been in this class have heard me say that the first couple classes, but there are things that need to be constantly working just right for mankind to live on this earth. And I had thought, wow, there in my heart is perhaps one of the greatest things that speak of the existence of God is the fact that God put all of these things in place that have to happen and if they didn't and even in a particular order life could not survive and I agree I don't have enough faith to be an atheist I may not have all the answers but I don't have enough faith to be an atheist um, it brings me ultimately to to Jesus Christ and in the message of the scriptures that God has revealed I'm going to read the last three of the ten that I put down uh, an anthropic constant. One is the Earth's rotation. 
And I want you to think how awesome God is, and that's how I'm going to address him when I open this class with prayer. Okay, the earth's rotation. If the rotation took longer than 24 hours, temperature differences would be too great between night and day. If the rotation period were shorter, atmospheric wind velocities would be too great. All right, now, this is minds beyond me. I, I don't have that mind, but let me quote someone who does by the name of James Tour, T-O-U-R. He is a nanoscientist, all right? He said, only a rookie who knows nothing about science would say science takes away from faith. If you really study science, it will bring you closer to God. And I thought, wow, that's, that, that's cool stuff. Another anthropic constant is atmospheric change. If this lightning rate were greater, there would be too much fire and destruction. If less, there would be too little nitrogen fixing in the soil. All right, I didn't realize that, that uh, lightning put nitrogen into the soil, and you need that. And the last one, so that we can say, wow, God, is seismic activity. If there were a lot more, life could not exist. If there were less, nutrients on the ocean floor and river runoff would not be cycled back to the continents through tectonic uplift. Said, so yes, even earthquakes are necessary to sustain life as we know it. Um, wow. Well, God is awesome. He's created things and put things in order. Um, yeah, I, I'm not a big computer tech person, but isn't that called RAM space? It's when you've got a cutting board, all the things you can bring up on your computer at once, and you've got all these things going at once. Well, God has a lot of RAM space. You know, he's able to keep everything going all at once so that life might survive. We serve an awesome God, and I'm going to open up by acknowledging him as that. Father, the more we look around us and open up our eyes, we see how awesome you truly are. Your word tells us in the Psalms that entry level to understand you is just to look out into the heavens and to recognize that we don't worship the sun, we don't worship the earth, we don't worship the rain, uh, but we worship someone, we go beyond that to the creator who made the heavens and the earth. We recognize your word, God, before us is ultimately that which points us to who you are and for your purpose for life. God, you are awesome. Uh, thank you for taking interest in us. Thank you, Lord, that even our faith is that which is a gift from you that you give to us. And we ask, increase our faith, O Lord. Help us so that we might be more that you want us to be um, being able to reach out to our world, that people could look at us and say how we live makes sense, and that they might be drawn to you because of our humility, uh, but also, Lord, the direction that we're pointing to, and that is away from ourselves. Guide us as we seek to interact with a world that's all the more globally in unison, uh, looking away from you and uh, acknowledging in pride itself and its achievements. Uh, Lord, we look to you today. We offer ourselves to you. We offer this class to you. Thank you for it. Thank you for the, your word and, and all of its uh, fun that is. We consider even Proverbs, Lord, that we can laugh at, but we can also recognize that they give us truths on how we might live. Um, help us to run well. Help us to finish well. Thank you for this uh, auditorium here in the church. The place that we worship is, uh, was brought to our attention today. Um, bless the event that takes place here uh, after this class as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Does everybody have a sheet? If not, Phoebe can pass one off to you. All right, today, uh, what I have done, if those of you who might be here for the first time anyway, I decided to go through the book of Proverbs um, just amidst all the heaviness of life and situations. I, I sat down for about a year, it started probably just after COVID and started reading the Proverbs and said, I, I want to just know how to live the Christian life. 
and uh, something a little bit on the on the lighter side. Though Proverbs, their night, their to live it is tough, you know. So when I say things are on the lighter side of Proverbs, I'm not saying that it's easy life, because uh, we all see ourselves in the Proverbs. That's kind of why it's exciting. I broke it down to different themes, and right now at this point, we're looking at what I have entitled personal temperance or restraint. All right, personal temperance or restraint. When I was reading through Proverbs, I came across ones here you'll see there, particularly in Proverbs 23. And the temperance movement was basically uh, the movement against drinking, right? Isn't that what temperance was, that term back in those days? Turn to Proverbs 23, verses 29 to 35. I'm going to go ahead and read just so that if anybody's online listening at some point, they will actually hear the verses themselves. Proverbs 23, verses 29 to 35. Yeah, I think if there's a time that you can kind of go a little bit of a chuckle in a, in a, in a reverent way, this is, this is it. Because the picture of a person who is inebriated certainly comes to place here. All right, verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaint? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to the sample bowls of mixed wine, do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? All right. I grew up in a... Pastor Denny will quite often talk about him growing up I'll call it as a church mouse. You know, he, he was in the church whenever activities were going on, and that is a part of his rich heritage, and that is really why God's able to use him in such a great way today and does do that. From an early young boy, he embraced Christianity and, of course, thought it through, embraced it, and uh, moved on. I grew up in a family that went to the bar all the time. And I remember sitting out in the car waiting with my, or my sister and I when dad and mom would bring us out peanuts and pop and try and keep us happy while they were in the bar. And a lot of alcohol and issues were in my own personal family. Um, my dad was an alcoholic, <laughs> probably. He drank with his buddies. You know, his friends were kind of like at Cheers. They're, they're the social people that he would go and soci- associate with. Uh, on, he would get together with Tootie. Uh, Tootie, something like that. The uh, gentleman's name there at the Hideaway Club in Missoula, Montana. And Dad was a mean drunk. You know, I, uh, you know, I honor my father, and if you were to sit and we could talk, I, I would honor him because he was a wonderful man, had a lot, uh, he was a hard worker, uh, a lot of wonderful qualities, but he, he, when he got inebriated, uh, he would be very mean. And uh, we grew up with a lot of that and a lot of statements in our minds and things that we, that was very hard. So I, I know the perils of, of alcohol. My m- mother, on the other hand, smoked. Uh, She would be, she was born in 1925, so what's that put her about 98 this year? Would have turned 98. Everybody during her era, most of the people, cigarette in one hand, drink in another, right? You know, so I don't, as I get older, I'm a little bit less difficult on my parents or a little bit hard on them. God told me one time, even though my mom died in 1980 and dad died in 1982, um, God had spoke to my heart and said, you know what, Eric, you can still honor, you still need to honor your mom and your dad. <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, I'm done with that. They're gone. And the scripture says, no, you need to honor your mom and dad. And I thought, you know, I want to do that. I do that by sharing how good they were and how wonderful they were. And 
um, I would love to share a testimony sometime, but both my parents came to faith in Christ at the end of their days. Amazing. Just amazing. You know, how awesome God was and how he answered our prayers and how each of them, in a different way, um, God had affirmed and they had made decisions for Christ. But again, I just say that to say this, and that I realize that alcohol is a, is a big issue. And if for those of you who've come from that background, um, Uncle George, uh, Aunt Mary from um, there in Kimball area, those old time folks would maybe know who George Johnson was, but he came out of that background and had a very lost one family as a result of that. And, and boy, I tell you, you mentioned alcohol and uh, you want to get into a fight, just tell them that a, a Christian can have a drink. And uh, he, was, he was very strong. And so it's not my ambition to be able to argue that out or for us really even too much. Uh, the church here uh, believes in, in moderation. And uh, I, I embrace that and understand that along that, that line. But I also recognize that those of you who have maybe come from Celebrate Recovery and that have a lot stronger feelings or from family background that know, well, wow, you stay away from the first drink, you know. So we're, I'm not trying to argue that out at this point, but just to mention that the Proverbs are pretty strong in saying, this is what life is like if you're going to do that. What are, what are some statements or words here that explain what the proverb is saying about alcohol? That you say, hey, that's true. No one needs to glorify it. We certainly don't want to do that. But if you say, yeah, this was me in college and this is why, we'll accept that. What are the things that you, yeah, Craig. Okay. 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 All right. Okay, the Apostle Paul, you had made, kind of quoted, and he had talked about, I think, to Timothy, he said, you know, take a little bit of wine, it's good for your stomach. There's a medicinal purpose at that point. Uh, um, Sometimes you go overseas and you don't know for sure the water's any good. Uh, so you might even crack open a pop or crack, crack open a, a, a drink. Uh, my, my second son went with torch bearers for, I think it was six weeks. He t was in a schooner with about 12 other, that's what I called a boat, sailing boat with I think it was about 13 to 20 other people, guys, girls, and they went on some of the sites and spots that the Apostle Paul went on. And they pu pulled in some of those ports and lived in that boat, and for six weeks we're doing that. Well, you know, he went into those places and they drank beer. <laughs> so it's kind of like, well, okay. All right, well, that's where, you know, love it or hate it, that's where he said, well, in Europe, that's what everybody drank. Okay. All right, what are, what are some of the, the effects here that's mentioned in, in this that you would affirm? Pardon me? Okay, bites like a snake. Oh, that's what my dad told me. He's talked about, he said, I, I only drink beer. He was from German, Germany. He, he, he could put it away. And he said, oh, Eric, that, oh, that are hard stuff. You don't want to drink that. I remember drinking some of that one time. Friends put it on me and I grabbed my keys and I couldn't find the keyhole to the car. He said, you want to stay away from that stuff, that hard stuff. So, all right, it bites. How about the opening statement? Who has woes? All right, you ever listen to people talk about their woes as a result of that? Yeah. Oh, I was just mentioning um, 31 there. My um, one says, don't gaze at the wine, seeing how red it is, how it sparkles in the cup, how it smoothly goes down. To me, that um, speaks more of like a, a preoccupation with it okay. rather than just a, an occasional okay. with dinner time. Okay, right. You know? right. Okay. You should mention as far as the watching it, uh, sweet and how smooth it goes down and that, that there's kind of a, a preoccupation of the person with the, with the drink. All right, I know for time-wise I'll have to keep moving here really quick, but it certainly describes, you know, a person with woes, 
Um, sorrow comes as a result of that. Uh, strife, oftentimes, we certainly experience that in my own personal family. Uh, confusion there is made mention of that. Uh, you know, how oftentimes people wake up the next day and they go, oh, I, what happened, you know, last night? Can you tell me? I just bruised, I got a bruise here or something. Uh, yeah, well, you know, you got in a fight with those eight guys, didn't you know that? Uh, and uh, those type of things you don't remember. So, you know, Proverbs takes a real clear picture of some of the issues. As a believer, I don't want to be held responsible for your fault. If you say, well, he's a Christian, but he still partakes, I don't want you then to become, you to stumble. Maybe I could handle that. Right. You can't. Right. Yes, the weaker brother, you know, um, the person as a pastor and that, I, I abstain from alcohol. And one of the main reasons along that line, even though we wouldn't want to have communion with real wine. And I believe that the Welch's, if I'm not mistaken, Welch's was developed so that people wouldn't have to take the real alcohol at communion time along that line. But I, I had some brothers in Christ that I was... Uh, good friends with that were alcohol, you know, alcohol background. It came from that. And it's the last thing I would want to do is for a, a weaker brother, as far as weaker being that was an issue he had, I, I wouldn't want them to stumble. Um, lots of, lots of interesting things there about that. So it certainly paints a picture of the issues that come place as abuse of that. Alcohol, you could say drugs. Yeah. Oh, Paul. I just wanted to mention that Back in those days, they didn't have refrigeration, and you know, the—that's the way wine preserves itself. Okay. And well, there's a problem. There's a lot. A lot of passages in the Old Testament, especially, say uh, wine is a benefit. Uh, it's you know, along with—it's a blessing in a sense. It's something that uh, if if things are you're prosperous, you your okay. grapes yeah. are uh, right. You're, you know, you're getting more a lot of wine. You're getting Green, you're getting, you know, the things that you need for life, and it's. You think that moderation has to be what, you know, is is allowable. Okay. Okay. Yes. It uh, just the fruit of the vine was something that spoke of, of how wealthy they were and how blessed they were of God. I. I mean, I think. Uh, isn't kimchi the stuff that cabbage they bury down in a hole and doesn't that ferment and become, I don't know if it becomes alcoholic, but you give enough of those things and they, they do become, uh, become fermented because they don't have the refrigeration as he was mentioning that we do now and a lot of the stuff that sat out in, in room temperature. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So this is just one example, perhaps a very strong example for sure. Uh, but uh, restraint, that's kind of why I put the restraint on there too. Uh, chapter 23, verses 20 and 21 speaks of the other, another issue. Uh, let's see, for drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. So if you, something takes over your time, your money, uh, then life loses a lot of what God would have for you and for it. Uh, because basically it's an addiction, I guess would be it. If you have an addiction, then you've got uh, issues there. And we'll talk a little bit about that, some of these other verses here. Um, 20, actually, I, I made a mistake, a typo. It's 23 verses 1 and 2 there, not 32. It says, Woe, when, excuse me, when you sit to, to dine with a ruler, note well what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you are given to gluttony. All right. I think basically there, if you go before the king, somebody's going to wine and dine you. 
Uh, those of us who are older, we get wine and dine to all these different groups. Come on up to this motel, and we're going to talk about uh, either a timeshare or a... Uh, uh, Here's the one now that I'm getting funeral plots and uh, funeral things and stuff along that line. But hey, you know, be careful. You might be, they might be working you. So show some restraint in those particular situations, I think is what's being said here. Uh, chapter 25, verse 28 says, Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. All right, wow, you yeah. know. Cities were the protection, right? And in, in the olden days, they had the fish gate, they had the sheep gate, they had all these different gates that you could go in, but they were definitely guarded. And to be secure, you'd wanted to be in a city. Well, it says if you lack, uh, lack self-control, it's basically, you know, you're asleep on the job and, and uh, people can come in and, and uh, ransack you. The playing field, I think, as Carol mentioned, there's a lot of different things. You know, you got anger, speech, greed, impulses, thoughts, appetites. All those things really are ones that uh, need restraint. Matthew chapter 11, verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say he is here as a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by her actions. And, of course, we know that the Lord himself would never have been found uh, drunk in any of these type of, type of things that are mentioned in Proverbs chapter 23. Uh, false accusations to him, but probably more so referring to the... Um, friendships that he had with sinners. We'll talk a little bit about that when I look at personal friendships and companions. Uh, the Lord was companions with those people and he was in places like that. Yeah. You say, what is the background? Why would someone make... Oh. Yeah, I think that they would be either false accusations or the fact that he was with them and uh, being reaching out to sinners that said he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So I, I think that that would be, it would have to be a false accusation. Uh, because everything, it would go against everything that's, that's we're looking at in the Proverbs as well as, as here. Uh, Okay. 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 Yeah, thank you. John the Baptist took the Nazarite vow, and so he would not take the wine when it was fermented. And that, that was a part of his vow, but Jesus didn't take that Nazarite vow. So if he had wine, well, I wouldn't say that he didn't have wine. I would say, did, was he drunk? Was he drunkard? Was he partaking in that lifestyle with totally the wrong purposes? Absolutely not. But I also recognize as we look at all the f fake news and all the issues today, I've come to start to realize how people get accused of things that there's nothing to do with that. It is not there, but people, you got always got all these people really quick to, to say things that are not true you know so when I read that's one thing I thought of too along that line uh, but it says the last ver last statement there but wisdom is proved right by her actions and I was looking at that this morning actually and I thought to me that's kind of saying that and, and this is just what I'm thinking I didn't look up at the commentary um, is just that you know uh, the proof's in the pudding <laughs> you know you look at his life and you don't see that so the proof is there that you couldn't make accusation against him uh, for that reason all right, First Timothy 3, I'm, I know I'm jumping a little bit on some of these, uh, skipping one. Uh, Luke 21, 34 talks about in the end times there's going to be a lot of this. Well, I'm going to look that up because that was a good verse too. Uh, Luke 21, 34 says, Be careful of your, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness and anxieties of life. 
and the day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. And I'm just going to put this in the context of the end times. And I think, you know, there's a lot of depression going on now uh, with young people as well as adults. And alcohol can be one of those outlets that, you know, he's saying here, um, you know, drunkenness and anxieties of life, they will become issues, especially in the end times when we, I think, people struggle with life and look to themselves and their world for answers rather than God. 1 Timothy 3.8 talks about leaders within the church here, particularly deacons, likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. And I, I wrote down on my notes here, do people buy what you're selling? <laughs> you know, if you're selling something, which means your faith and who Jesus is and who the Christ-like is, then that doesn't make it very attractive to people from the outside. And uh, I think that's a good point from that. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 says, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, is, is self-control. And I think that, again, talks about restraint. When they look at our lives as leaders, it says, yeah, these are things for leaders, but the truth of the matter is it's for everybody. It's just so happened that if you don't have those qualities of the leader, you shouldn't be in that position. But all of us should be people showing, some, showing restraint. I sometimes call this the tale of two gutters. And that is that sometimes you can take the things... I'll take sexuality because that's a perfect example. If Satan can get you, people convinced, one gutter or the other, he's got you beat. And one is thinking that it's terrible. It's not right. It's not good. You know, and then you don't realize the greatness of God, as Denny was talking about in the church. I mean, he uses that as a picture of the marital intimacy, but that it is a beautiful thing. It's a God-given thing. And, and so some people maybe would deny that. They'll go, oh, it's bad, you know. And the other hand is like our society is, and that's the gutter of anything goes. There's nothing sacred at all. And I think that sometimes Satan wants to work the gutters. He wants us to get to an extreme of one side or the other, and God is saying no restraint, but also understanding it as God would have it for your life in its positive way. So uh, most people he's going to get to hit on the excess. On the other hand, you might get a few people on the other, on the other gutter as well. Um, any comments, closing comments or thoughts, again, on that of restraint? Maybe there's some other area that you say, this is the playing field of that. All right. Um, you know, Proverbs speaks the most about anywhere else in the scriptures on this issue of, of uh, alcohol and showing restraint and temperance. Uh, personal humility. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. I skipped past that. 1 Corinthians 6.12. All right, thank you. I'm glad you pointed that out again because that is one I'm looking at. It's Paul saying, you know, everything's permissible, you know, a lot of things are permissible, let's put it that way, you know, along that line, are good. But he said, I'm not going to let anything master me. And that, that is a great point as far as Christianity. When we come to faith in Christ, we say we give our heart to him, right? We, we turn our lives over to him. We, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You know, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All th things have become new. So we... We embrace, we serve a new master, and we no longer want to be controlled by anything. And uh, there it's kind of opened up just the fact that don't let something master you. If it's mastering you, then it's become your Lord. And those are the things that we're still in route. You know, we're still in route. We understand that. Uh, we have our moments, but we want God to take over for those. All right, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, personal humility.
Proverbs 11.2. said, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. With humility comes wisdom. Um, we understand pride to be the initial sin of Lucifer himself. He had taken from Isaiah who, you know, wanted to be God. And uh, the issue of pride is, he, is huge there. The Hebrew word means to boil up. It's to boil up. So kind of an, an, an inflated pin, opinion of yourself. A person who's proud has an inflated opinion that kind of boils up within them that uh, is, is all about them. Chapter 15, verse 33 says, the fear of the Lord teaches a man wisdom, and humility comes before honor. All right, uh, 1133, humility comes before honor. Can you think of any other, any New Testament verses or anything that might, um, of course I got other verses coming down there, but do you remember a, a story or was it a parable? Anyway, he's talking about uh, Jesus saying, don't go to the head table when you go into a place. You know, think more highly of yourself and you go on up and then have the person call you back and say, "Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's saved for someone else, you know. Is that it's better that you go and take the low seat and then get called up to say, oh, no, you know. So that kind of that, humble yourself and then you will be exalted. Those of you who know old praise songs, there was one that humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I think that came from uh, one of these verses. Proverbs 18, 12. Before his downfall, a man's part is proud, but humility comes before honor. Um, there again, I guess you allow God to bring you up and other people to affirm that in you rather than immediately going and saying, look at me, you know. Uh, So if you want to be honored, then start out by humbling yourself. There's some New Testament verses there. I'll just uh, tell you about Luke 11, 43. It's basically, Jesus said, well, the Pharisees love to to be in the line light. You know, I said, don't be as that. They love to be seen and be heard and to be known and to be acknowledged. Don't, don't be that type of person. Ephesians 4, verse 2. A part of my goal when we got into Proverbs is I wanted to do, um, be able to affirm to us that it's a, they're totally a biblical um, teachings. You know, they're, they're, they're seen in the New Testament as well and other spots of the Bible. Some of them we might look and just acknowledge it, but then uh, not realize that actually they're illustrated very well in the lives of Jesus and the lives of the disciples and the lives of the church. Uh, they're very pertinent issues that we're talking about here. Um, let's see, I said Ephesians 4.2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. All right, there's the term there to be humble. There's something becoming about humility, isn't it? Is humility the same as a low (laughs) self-esteem? No, what's the difference? So where do they intersect? Low self-esteem also thinks of itself? Okay. You know, it's kind of like that meekness. It's strength in check, right? Strength, meekness, they say it's not the same as being walked over. It's basically having strength and power, but it's kept in check. You know, that Jesus was meek in that way. And I think that's kind of explained, illustrated here a little bit as well in regards to... um, to uh, true humility is not being down and out necessarily. Uh, James 4.10 
It says, humble yourselves with the Lord, the Lord and he will lift you up. All right, that's where that song came in, I think. But humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Um, I'm thinking of the Psalms just poked in my head. And um, isn't there a song that goes something about you're my glory and the lifter of my head? You're my strength, the lifter of my head. And in Old Testament times, in victor, victorious times and stuff, that you would put the, your foot on the neck of the person that you conquered. And that was kind of like showing you won, they're down. And I think sometimes, I don't know if this is particularly what's in mind here, but I've thought of it personally myself. I've thought of, you know, Lord, you're the lifter of my head. You know, sometimes I mean, Satan wants to get you down. Others may want to get you down. But no, God is the one who's going to lift up your head in those times when you feel like, uh, feel like you're, you know, down, pushed down. 1 Peter 5.5. 5. I tried to get it so you can just keep turning right in your scriptures, but it didn't always work because sometimes some thoughts kind of needed to go back and forth on the scripture verses there. Uh, but James, and then Peter, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Uh, I'm, go ahead, yeah. Okay. You're older, right? Yeah. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wyatt, I bet you're one of the youngest ones here. Thank you for being here. All the rest of us are older, so, you know, we got a lot of wisdom here to share. Thanks. I'm, so, I'm really glad to have you here, uh, Wyatt. Really am. Um, I, I won't go into this, but Philippians chapter 2, the incarnation, that's a word that's a theological word, not necessarily a biblical word, but when, we, when God you know, incarnated and became through Christ his son, and Pro Philippians chapter 2 says, have this mind that was in God, you also have that who humbled himself, becoming a man, you know, gave up as such the privilege of using the rights that he could in 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 uh, coming down to earth, so you think about it. This little little dancing bear act of ours, right? And then you got the God that created all this stuff and sustains it and keeps it going. And and that He actually said, "Well, I think the best way to reach man is to become one, and to send my Son down in the form of a man." Personal humility. Any illustrations of that? Any? thing from any of you here that said, yeah, I humbled myself and God lifted me up in due time or, yeah. I would say we live in a culture that it goes just the opposite, that does not promote personal humility but pride and, and glorification of self. If you look at TV, the vast majority of the commercials that we see in the programs are not about humility but about exaltation of self. So we have a, a counterculture. Okay. And if the more we immerse ourselves in TV and media, we see that and it can seep into our hearts and our beings, so we have to be careful. Okay. Okay, yes. But we are to call, aren't we called to think more highly of others than ourselves? Yes, yeah, yes. Don't not look merely for your own personal interests, but also look out for others. And and I believe that's in Romans, if I'm not mistaken. I remember one time doing a study on that, and it basically said, um, at least a verse that was parallel to that, if not that one, it was basically to prefer one another in honor was to outdo one another. And what really hit to me was, I like to outdo people in pranks. And if you start pranking me, and my brother-in-law and I, we would prank each other all the time. So I, I came home one time. God, stories are fun, right? Back in Missoula, Montana, came home. My brother-in-law didn't eat his food. He conquered it. Well, one time we were having burgers, and he put all kinds of stuff on it, you know. And then he got a business call, and he left the room. So I took one of those four-fold napkins, ripped it in half, stuffed it in his burger with all that stuff, put the lid back on it. 
By the time he'd come back, my sister had forgotten what I'd done, but he ate the whole thing. And I laughed and said, well, you don't really need to wipe your mouth, do you? Because you probably took care of that when you ate your burger. And what? Well, you just ate half that napkin. <laughs> really? And so later on that night, I fell asleep. I was a college student, fell asleep on the couch and uh, woke up here. Here's some ice cream, Eric, you know, and it's vanilla ice cream with some uh, chocolate on it, you know, Hershey's chocolate. Well, by the time I was still partially asleep, started eating, I found out it was barbecue sauce, you know, you know. And, and anyway, he said, hey, okay, I'm going to outdo you. And that actually became a picture in my mind that kind of spoke to my heart at that time. And I thought, Eric, you need to be thinking like, this prank stuff, how can you outdo love for your fellow brothers and sisters? You know, put it, put it to your mind. What are you going to do? So, yeah, that's, that's uh, a huge thing to honor one another. I think our society, you'll hear the term a lot with narcissism and stuff like that. The people are just so focused on themselves and they're very proud. And you'll, you'll see that that is a huge issue right now in the uh, in the, we'll call it the last days, really. Let's, I'm going to look at the last one quickly here. Um, I'm going to look and see what time it is. Oh, two minutes. Okay. Uh, personal friends and companions. Um, I, I think we'll look at this this next week. Is that, all, is that okay? Rather than blast through this, there really is some good stuff in that. You know, different times as a, as a teacher, you kind of come in and you go some fears. One is, what if no one shows up? Thank you for coming. And then you go, what if a hundred show up? <laughs> you know. The other is, what if someone asks a question that I can't answer? You know, that's always in the back of your mind. Paul, you'd maybe come up with some good ones, questions I may or may not. And the fourth one is, oh, I'm not going to have enough material. <laughs> I haven't like that's ever happened. Uh, you know, I get to realize how quickly time goes and uh, I need to keep things moving. So next week what we're going to do is we're going to look at personal friends and companions and then personal disputes. Those are things that are made mention of numerous times in Proverbs. I'll take other scriptures and two and some illustrations. That will complete that. After that we will have, is it one more week? I think it's, yeah, May 7th. And that I'm going to take just some favorite ones because there are some really cool proverbs that when you read them, you kind of go, oh, wow, that's funny. That's real. That's really to life. That's, that's true. And we'll look at a few of those. I, I could probably spend f five, six sessions on those things. Mm -hmm.